Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Scripture chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Now, today is Friday. Of course, as we have said previously this week, we are in Edmonton, Canada, for a conference with Pastors Darcy and Miranda Bork at the Weston. It's a conference we've participated now for our third year, and so we are pre-recording the broadcast. And Today is Friday, and that means two things that we ask you to do. If the morning light is a blessing to you, would you take time to use the share, the like button, or to email the link for the Bible study to someone that you think would just be blessed by it, morninglightbiblestudy.com, or they can go to propheticnow.com and click on the Morning Light link and find all of the broadcasts archived in the live broadcast as they come forth at 9 Central Time here in the United States. And the other thing on Friday is we give you opportunity. We don't talk money through throughout the week. We're not taking up offerings and spending broadcast time and your precious time taking up offerings every single week. But on Fridays, Friday, we call that Giving Day. And it's the day number one. I just want to thank you for your faithful support of Father's Heart Ministry. Uh, your giving is uh, a facilitator of that, which we're able to do in going around the world preaching the gospel, of uh, doing the things that we do here at Father's Heart Ministry. We believe that we're good ground. We've seen hundreds of people come to Christ through our evangelism initiative at newexpectations.net. We've taken over right at 3,000 people through our prophetic online school over the last few years. Uh, we go to great lengths of raising up a testimony, a prophetic testimony. And for those of you that have supported us, those of you that give so faithfully and sacrificially, many of you, we want you to know that none of that goes unnoticed. We thank you for your giving and, and we just invite you. If you're not a partner with Father's Heart Ministry, we invite you to go to propheticnow.com, make a one-time offering, a one-time gift, or choose to become a partner. There's a donation link. Go to propheticnow.com or fathersheartministry.net. If you want to mail your donation in, there's an address there. If you want to phone your donation in, there's a number there that you can call, and our assistants will be there to help you, to answer the phone and help you make a donation. Uh, it's, it's fitting. It's a fitting transaction that heaven smiles upon. That makes a difference in your life. It makes a difference in this initiative of preaching the gospel. And so be prompt Give into the anointing. When you give into the anointing, it causes money to move by the Spirit. It's something I've learned a long time ago. We practice it in our own lives. And we just uh, ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would speak to our listeners. And Lord, on this day that we set aside to invite them to give, that you provoke them, Father. And you would speak to them, not only to go and to give, but you'd give them the number, the amount that they would give that would be pleasing to you. As so many have had such a keen listening ear to be faithful to support the ministry, I ask even now, God, that you bless them in return. And those that are listening, God, that they would find that way. I'm going to give into the anointing. I must give. Like they laid the money at the apostles' feet. It's when they give into the anointing, something detonates in the glory. And I thank you for moving upon your people today to give in support of the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Now, today we are studying in Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. God contends with our generation. In chapter 4 of Hosea, the prophet cries out as God's spokesman against the blindness of the people regarding their own adulterous ways. God had had Hosea marry a woman named Gomer, an unfaithful woman, in order to demonstrate. He put love in Hosea's heart for this woman to demonstrate to the people in Hosea's day that even though they'd been unfaithful, how deeply he loved them. 
And this is recorded for us, not just as history or historical narrative, but it's God saying something to you and I, as Paul said in Corinthians, that these things happened to them under the old covenant as examples to us, upon whom the hands of the age have come. So there's a message here for you and I. The peoples uh, in Hosea's generation, they deeply bemoaned, among other things, the decadence of the younger people in their midst, but Hosea declares that the decadence and godlessness of youth was only a reflection of the older generation's refusal to walk in humility before God. And so we, we do that. We look at the younger generation. We say, what's this world coming to? But before we judge too harshly and say how they need to change, maybe we need to look at ourselves as the older generation and identify the seedbed in our generation that has produced what we see in the younger generation. And that's reflected in our message today in Hosea chapter 4, of course, going through the Bible chapter by chapter. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 19. We'll just read the whole chapter and then make comments. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. Therefore shall the land mourn and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven. Yea, the fishes of the sea shall also be taken away. Yet let no man strive, neither reprove one another. For thy people are as they that strive with the priest. In other words, it's not about finger pointing. Therefore you will fall in the day, and the prophet shall fall with thee in the night. And I will destroy thy mother. And our mother, what is our mother? It's the church. The mother was what? It was Jerusalem to the old covenant saints. And Jerusalem was destroyed. Verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It isn't God arbitrarily acting. It's the refusal of the people to receive the knowledge of God. He said, because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you. And you will be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget your children. And they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people, and they set their heart on their iniquity. And there shall be like people like priests, and I will punish them for their ways, and reward them for their doings. They shall eat and not have enough. They will commit whoredom and will not increase, because they have left off to take heed to the Lord. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. My people ask counsel at their stocks or their idols, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredoms has caused them to err. And they have gone whoring from under their God. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms, because the shadow thereof is good. Therefore your daughters shall commit whoredom, and your spouses shall commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredoms, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. For themselves are separated with whores, and they sacrifice. Well, what difficult language. They sacrifice with harlots. Therefore the people that doth not understand shall fall. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. And come not to Gilgal. Neither go ye up to Bethaven, nor swear, the Lord liveth. For Israel slides back as a backsliding heifer, like an animal in heat, in other words. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Their drink is sour, they've committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love give ye. The wind hath bound her up in her wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. So in chapter 4 of Hosea, the prophet comes as God's spokesman, charging the nation with their truce-breaking, 
their inveterate abandonment of the truth of God, the mercy of God, and the knowledge of God. You know, man sins, and he suffers the consequences, and instead of asking, why did I bring my bring this on myself, the default judgment is always, how could God allow, look what God has done to me. How could God allow this to happen to me? In this manner, the absence of God's mercy does not originate with him, but with our own disobedient conduct that estranges us from his clemency in our lives and in our situation. And see, this is the controversy. God is addressing the controversy. Will people say, how could God let this happen? And God's addressing the controversy. He's expressing to them that because of their unfaithfulness and for the systemic culture of violence, perverse speech, dishonesty, and bloodletting, for this reason they have suffered. So because of these sins. Verse 3 tells us that the land will mourn along with the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea that would be taken away. Now, we look today at things happening in our ecology. Today, ecologists bemoan mass extinctions and the shifting global uh, climate, and they point to industrialization run amok, but the scripture says these problems, is it because we need uh, the Kyoto Accords, uh, that we need to have a smaller carbon footprint? No, we need to have a smaller sin footprint. Are you listening? We point to industrialization run amok, but the scripture says these problems, flood, Fire, ice caps melting, storm cycles intensifying are originating not in the mismanagement of natural resources, but the moral failure of the nation. We are told in two places, now let's read it, in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 18.28, that whenever they would break the covenant, he said, if you... If you are not obedient, that the land would spew you out because you have defiled it, even as it spewed out the nations that were before you. Leviticus 20.22 said, You will keep all my statutes and my judgments and do them, that the land where I bring you spew you not out. Even the land is... We see calamities and more afflict the nation, but verse 4 says, Rather than striving with one another pointing to the alleged flagrant and systemic uh, abuse of the environment. How about the flagrant and systemic sinfulness in our culture? We tend to strive with leaders. We're pointing to leaders to blame leaders for things that they have nothing to do with. We accuse leaders of being out of touch in, in reality when in fact we are out of touch with reality. Our behaviors, the behavior of our culture, is at the root of much suffering that was intensifying difficulty in Hosea's day and the personal lives of the people. So don't be pointing fingers at one another. Verse 5 tells us that the people will fall in broad daylight. Why? Not because of something a leader did. We want to blame the president. We want to blame the Oval Office. We want to look to the political as the source of all these problems. But the troubles of the nation is something that would come in broad daylight caused by the sinfulness of the people. Regardless of being steeped in denial that our nation would ever fall. The children of Judah could not conceive. The children of the northern tribes could not conceive. They believed that they were in fact the chosen people. And regardless of their personal choices or lifestyles, they thought that Judah and Israel would never fall. Why? Because they said they were God's children by Abraham. And this attitude exists in our nation. In our nation we say, God will never judge America because so much of the gospel originates in America and is spread around the world. How many times have I heard that in the last 30 years? I've heard men get up and churches full of people say, Amen. God will never judge America. 
the God who judged Judah, the line of the kings of David, the ten northern tribes, and allowed them to go to fall for the city of Jerusalem to be leveled, for the temple to be destroyed, and God will not judge the western world for its decadence? That is colossal hubris. The Jews in Jesus' day thought this. Even after the captivity, when they came back, they adopted that same attitude. And Jesus told them in Matthew 3, 9, Think not to say to yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say that God is able to have these stones to raise up children to Abraham. The Jews could not see God working with anyone other than them. This was the excuse they generated and the false security they clung to because they knew that looking to the law of God constituted them as offenders. They simply believed that the yearly sacrifice when the high priest atoned for the nation would be enough and that their sins would be covered and thereby they would not suffer the consequences of their sin. They knew what they were. Unfortunately, this is exactly the false doctrine that pervades church culture today. By suggesting that those Christians' lives who fall so far short of God's expectation, yes, we know the church falls short, but we say the blood covers it all, just like the Jews in Jesus' day, before the temple was destroyed, Judaism was destroyed and sent into captivity, scattered throughout the nations and suffered for generations. They thought, well, we're the children of Abraham. God will never let that happen. (laughs) And we say, well, the blood covers it all. God would never look anywhere but to the church and the community of the redeemed to bring about his purposes. Tell that to the first century Jewish system. Those who think that Christianity is too big to fail need to learn the lesson that Judaism learned in bitter failure after having been rejected by their mas- after they after they rejected their messiah and they saw their race and religion become a pariah among nations why because they flaunted their s- sin in the face of god verse 6 famously declares that the people of god are destroyed for lack of knowledge not that the knowledge of god was not available to them But they had by default rejected the knowledge of God and chosen to marginalize the law of God and the word of God in their lives. Because they had forgotten the word of God in their day, the Father says he will forget them. Ask yourself the question, if the lack of esteem in the place of God's word in the life of the average Christian was the metric for God's involvement with his people, what would that look like? What if God neglected the church the way the average Christian neglects the word of God? Is this not exactly the fallout predicted to come upon the people of Judah by the word of the prophet Hosea? Is this not a warning to us that if God spared not the natural branches of Judaism, but rejected them because of unbelief, what fate awaits Christian culture if we're going to be held accountable for the marginalization of God's word in our culture and true accountable relationship to him in our culture and our personal lives? Verse 7 goes on to tell us that because the people were increased and blessed, yet continued in sin, that God would change their glory into shame. In other words, they're in disobedience, but they're being blessed. Romans 2, 4, and 5 says, God's goodness leads men to repent. If you are experiencing God's goodness and not responding in godly fear and reverential reformation of your lifestyle, what is the outcome? In other words, we need to let the goodness of God provoke us to get closer to him. Instead, we wait till bad circumstances come and then we start trying to get close to God. (coughs) The definition of this from God's standpoint is that our hearts are set on iniquity. Not the sinner who doesn't know God, but the believer who calls upon his name without consequence or accountability to his word in spite of the outpouring of his goodness. He's good to us, but we continue to go our own way. You have to ask yourself, are you capable of change? Are you capable of self-examination? If God did require something of you in terms of actually changing your current conduct or your current relationship 
or your current convictions to a degree that it would be an inconvenience to you? Are you capable, are you even capable of making that adjustment? You have to ask yourself that question. The children of Judah were incapable and they paid for it with their lives. Being led into captivity, leaving the smoldering ruins of their lives behind them because they refused to repent and live in the fear of God. Verse 12 declares that the people were looking for answers at the altars of their idols. Zechariah 4 6 tells us that it isn't by might, it isn't by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord things get done. When we look to man for solutions, that constitutes idolatry. God, in Hosea, terms it whoredom. When Christian culture looks to the political arena for answers, or to the courts, or to any other instrumentality, then God, for their deliverance, God constitutes that as going whoring out from under their God, as verse 12 defines it, just as a deceitful wife goes out from under the embrace of her husband to seek out various lovers. The metaphor cannot be more graphic. We look at the decadence of our youth culture, and we don't see any sense of restraint or boundaries among the youth. But verse 14 says, when the younger generation debauches itself unchecked, it is because God chooses not to chastise them because of the secret sins of the generation before them. We can look at the younger generation and bemoan the fact that they have their lack of anchor in the things of God, their lack of a moral compass. We say that's a reflection of the separation between their fathers and the living God, according to verse 14, in terms of honest and true fidelity to his word. So when we look at the younger generation, the answer is not to cluck our tongues and wag our fingers at the youth, but to ask God to identify our generation, the 50-something generation. God, identify our transgression that we could find grace to make amends in our own lives as an example to the younger generation, however difficult it is for us to find anything actually wrong in our lifestyle choices. Because of the sins of the nation, verse 19 tells us that the wind of ungodly spiritual influence will clip the wings of the nation of Judah and ultimately cause them to be ashamed of the sacrifices they have made to facilitate the worship of the works of their own hands. The lesson for us is to identify the spiritual influences that have brought our nation into captivity, our generation, when we thought we were just merely exercising our freedoms in Christ, but were in fact wrapping ourselves up into the chains of captivity forged of our own iniquity. A very, very sobering chapter, and one that it's, it's not a message. It always amazes me to see the uh, account of people who uh, listen to the broadcast over time, and it's amazing to me that the, when the description has to do with sternness, a stern message, how that it just doesn't get listened to much because we don't have an appetite for it. God's been so good to us and poured out his grace upon us, but we don't have an appetite for stern correction. And, and I get the Bible says the day will come in the last days that men are just not going to receive correction. And that's why I advocate so strongly. Look, I get that there come a point that if, if I personally meddled in your life to a, to a degree that got too personal for you, that would be a breaking of our relationship. And I understand that. That's the human condition. But how about being self-correcting? And of course, I realize that sometimes someone can come and try and correct you, and they've got big things in their own life that need corrected. And it's hard to receive correction from a leader whenever you see fracture in their own lives. But how about being self-correcting? How about looking at ourselves? The Bible says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Submit your own selves, the scripture says. Uh, we have leaders sometimes out there trying to make people submit, trying to be corrective when their own lives are a big mess. How about teaching the people of God to be self-correcting? How about teaching the people of God to examine, he says, examine yourselves. To be honest with you, I think letting another man examine you, that's a recipe for trouble. 
But how about examining yourself? And how about leaders that will teach people to live out this life before God on their own recognizance, holding themselves accountable to God? Are we, are we capable of that? I believe that you are, I believe that you are capable of self-correction. And Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus, as we read these difficult chapters, going through the Bible chapter by chapter, it, it isn't always pleasant. It isn't always one that leaves us uh, rejoicing, but it leaves us at best thoughtful, perhaps chastened, perhaps uh, introspective. But God, I pray that you'd release a grace for your people to be self-correcting and transparent before you to live out this life on our own recognizance, rejoicing in the goodness of God, circumspect in our walk, walking barefoot before a living God who's so good to us, but we don't ever want to do anything to grieve him. We thank you for it, Father, for your goodness in Jesus' name.